Salam everyone, uh, my name is Omar Aziz. Welcome to the Samawar Network. Um, we're here today. Uh, the Samawar Network is a monthly online panel discussion with Afghan Americans discussing issues that are impacting our community. Um, and tonight, um, our session is called TSN, Afghans Reflecting on Orlando. Um, and we wanted to get together because of um, the tragic incident that uh, happened in Orlando, Florida, where 50, over 50 people were killed and 50 injured. Um, this shooting was at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, which was a, in a celebration for um, LGBT pride um, for the Latino community. Uh, so it was labeled as the worst mass shooting in American history, and the attacker was identified as an American-born Afghan male. And so we wanted to hold this discussion to really, you know, stand in solidarity with the victims and the families um, who were tragically impacted by this, and uh, discuss kind of what this means for, um, for for all the communities that have have been affected by this incident. Um, so we hope we, you know, we do a good job in this, and, and hope our intentions are good um, in in reflecting what what the folks here are thinking and and, and showing that support um, for the people that have been impacted. Um, so, yeah, my name is Omar, and I'm calling from uh, the Bay Area, uh, California, and we'll be starting on my left to introduce everybody on our panel. Ali, just uh, introduce yourself and where you're calling from. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Alomi, and I'm calling from Orange County. And Dawood? My name is Dawood Waziri, and I'm calling in from Orange County, California, as well. And Crystal? My name is Crystal, and I'm calling from Oakland, California. And Nada? Salam, everyone. My name is Nada, and I'm calling from Oakland, California. Nura? Salam. My name is Nura, and I'm calling from Durham, North Carolina. And Reza? Salam, everyone. My name is Reza. I'm calling from the Los Angeles area. And Saba? Salam everyone, um, my name is Sabah and I'm calling from the Bay Area, California. So we'll, jo we'll go ahead and uh, just get started. Um, for folks who are watching, um, we have a Facebook page, Facebook event page, where we do our best to engage and interact with folks. So please feel free to comment, um, write some questions. Uh, we really, you know, want to hear from folks um, about what, you know, about you know how they've been processing this, and you know any questions that we ask of each other, feel free to respond to those in in the chat. And um, you know if you have questions, we'll do our best to get to them. Um, and this is a difficult topic, I think, for all of us to to discuss. And I, I think we were struggling with you know coming to terms with how to address this you know very sensitive issue and um, how it's impacted you know so many different folks in different ways. Uh, so we're going to do our best to to make this a, a, a productive discussion, but. Um, first, wanted to just start a little bit about just like you know your thoughts and reflections and just kind of you know what 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 were you thinking or, or how are you feeling uh, right after this happened? Um, so if we can get just kind of started on, on with that, and Dawood, you can go ahead and and get us going. Yeah, for me, so uh, I woke up yesterday to like a hundred text messages in my family group message, and it was just my my cousins talking about what was going on. And I I went quickly to like CNN.com and and saw what happened, and my instant response was just like sadness. I didn't want to get out of bed. I was sitting there reading the article and reading the guy's name and what happened, and I was just completely saddened and just in a state of shock. Like I didn't I didn't want to leave my house. I was so like uh, discouraged and depressed off of it. And Nora, go ahead. Yeah, um, I found out about it, and my initial reaction was alarm. I have a lot of friends from Florida, so I started messaging them and checking in if their loved ones were okay, what was going on. And then when I found out who it was, it was just this, like, oh, my God, like, suddenly you're thinking about the identity politics. This person is Afghan and Muslim. But I stopped for a minute, and I was like, you know what? I have a right as a human being who has loved ones that identifies gay, that have loved ones that are part of Latino communities, that are from Florida, to just grieve and mourn. 
So it's been this weird consciousness of knowing the politics that are going on, but trying to give myself the right to grieve and mourn about the tragedy. And it's hard when you have these intersectional identities at play to not intellectualize, especially given that like I'm an academic, so I tend to think about that stuff. But just give, you know, it's okay to give yourself a day and really process the human tragedy and loss and and, and recognize that part of it too. Did anyone else kind of, I feel like that's a common reaction I think for, for a lot of folks. I, I wonder if anyone had a similar similar reaction or wanted to share what else, uh, how else they were feeling. Neda, go ahead. Yeah, I think for me um, it was really similar to what you were just saying. Like I felt like initially I was just numb. It was like, oh, like this is happening. It feels like, to the feeling was like, oh, it's happening again. It feels like this um, inevitable just like just anticipating like what's going to happen next, what's the backlash going to be, like how am I going to support folks with that. Um, and so I think that was really difficult, especially like the initial articles I saw were, you know, didn't have a lot of information, but one of the things they did share was that like, oh, it's likely that it was a terrorist attack. Like they were so sure about that, but not a lot of other things. And so that was hard. Um, but I think something I did do was didn't push myself to respond right away, even though I wanted to. And I just like, we also owe it to ourselves to just give ourselves time and process and not feel like we have to be the one representative for our community right away at least because that's just so exhausting. Um, so I think for me those were some things that I thought about initially. Um, one thing I was um, thinking about was, you know, after this happened and um, you know, originally I, I heard the name of the person, and you know, we we share the same name. Uh, you know, I share the same name as the shooter. You know, his name is also Omar. Um, you know, he's an Avian American, grew up, and I found myself like, and I and I felt really guilty and horrible for it. But like, I found myself thinking about the shooter more than I was about the victims, um, and just like thinking about like, you know, how this impact. And then I just like automatically go into response mode, and into like, you know, okay, what do we need to say? Who's reacting? How are they reacting? What 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 needs to happen right now, and then you know I I go to work the next day and I'm you know or, or excuse me just that day and I'm and I you know interacting with my with my coworkers who are part of the queer community and I just like I'm just like whoa like you know they're checking in with me about how I'm doing and I'm like you know fifty fifty over fifty people died like from you know from that community and and for me to be thinking about the shooter and it's just like this weird kind of mix of like guilt of like you know why am I thinking about the shooter and not the victims but then it was just a lot, whole lot of different things and then when I saw them in that moment I was really starting to to think about you know how this was impacting other communities and to like not be, just be thinking about myself um, so that was something that I think I was kind of wrestling with a lot. Um, Crystal if you want to go ahead and share. Um, first, I want to say that I'm grateful that this is happening and that we get to have this discussion amongst us. Thanks for holding the space. And um, I feel completely heartbroken um, that so much hatred has been existing against um, queer people for, for decades and throughout American history and that someone from our diaspora um, growing up in uh, has fallen into this um, systemic oppression that culture, cultural oppression that America fosters around homophobia. And it's just terrible to see that it was people of color, also another group that is continuously targeted um, and incarcerated mostly in the states um, being, being killed. So I not only see this as an act of um, homophobia, I also see it as an act of racism. And it's, it also made me think about my first year of going to the Afghan American Conference and how um, there wasn't a priority to discuss LGBTQ issues because there wasn't, um, some people said that we weren't ready for it. And we are ready for it. We've been ready for it. It's something that we need to look at and talk about this taboo issue and also domestic violence um, and see how all these forms of oppression are in a row um, because 
us as an Afghan people, we're strong, we're powerful, we're beautiful, we're caring and loving. And with so much war that's been put onto our diaspora, it's super important for us to begin to remember what sort of people we really are and to tolerate diversity and to support one another. Um, so I just feel completely heartbroken and also excited to see that there is this transformation that's happening within the Afghan community and how it's important for us as young adults to step up and really begin challenging our elders even though it's scary. I know a lot of Afghans who've been disowned, pushed out, threatened to be killed for coming out as queer um, and this is something that we have to fight within our own community and also on a systemic level in America. And Saba, you want to go ahead? Um, so I very similar to Dawood, I woke up to a whole slew of text messages just kind of like, it was like CNN on my phone but through my friends and my family and um, I was, honestly I was paralyzed, I felt paralyzed, I, it was like a whole sensation of emotions and just trying to process and quite honestly I'm still trying to process it right now, um, you know, hasn't been too many days since it's happened. Um, but I think like one of the first things that I thought about is that everybody, all people, they deserve to and they have a right to live freely without fear of being targeted for their for their sexual orientation, for their faith, for the color of their skin and it's just like it was like as if like all these things kind of combined and happened like at once you know and so it was just it's just a lot to process and then on top of that um, I mean the reality is that like the shooter was Afghan you know and so there was like also like a sense of I don't know I hate to say it but I felt slightly like some kind of responsibility and guilt, you know, and I was trying to shake that off and process that and just, you know, heartbroken for what happened to the LGBTQ community and, and that something so hateful could happen. And, and, it, and it's not like it hasn't happened before, it has, you know, but, but to this degree and to this scale, it's just, it's awful. Uh, Reza, go ahead. Yeah, just, I mean, to that responsibility thing, I don't think that um, you're the only one who felt a little bit of responsibility, Saba. Like, I, I felt um, a little responsible, too, in a way, right? Even though I've never met any Afghan from Florida ever, uh, I still felt a, a sense of, like, oh, my God, that's my kin, right? But at the same time, I also, just intellectually, I realized that, like, that is not anybody that I know or I'm, you know, I'm not responsible for his actions and it's just interesting to see the sort of like tug of war internally be exhibited externally within the wider community. Like on my Facebook page there were individuals who were uh, saying very passionately that we have no responsibility for this guy, right? You have never met him, you have never met him, you have never met him, we've never met him before and so we're not responsible for his actions. And then there are others who were um, stating very bluntly that there is a culture of homophobia within the community that we need to combat that fed into uh, this man's actions, not just within the Afghan or Muslim community, but also within the American community as well, that just all sort of coalesce in this one man's actions. And so that internal struggle that I had that you expressed, I thought it was really interesting that it was happening externally um, on my Facebook and amongst other Afghan Americans as well. What, what would you like to have seen or have heard? What do you think is the... How, what is the appropriate way to respond to something like this? I'm pointing at you. Or Ali, you want to answer that? Or Reza, go ahead. Yeah, if, if Reza is not uh, jumping go in, for I'm Ali. happy to answer that. Um, I think um, there really isn't, right off the bat, one singular response that's going to be right. We're not a, a homogenous community. We're not all the same. This is a diverse community and we're going to have different responses. The one important thing is is to make it about the victims, right? It's easy as Omar you kind of you talked about um, you know, you felt you started thinking about the shooter. And that that's something we can do, right? Because on many ways we go, "Oh, well he's Afghan, I'm Afghan." Right? He's Afghan American, I'm Afghan American. But what we should be doing is empathizing with the people 
or the victims themselves. I think that's how we orient ourselves, but what that response looks like, it's going to differ. We're, we're, a bit, we're a small community, but we're a diverse community. There's going to be different ways that we address this, um, and it doesn't mean that we need to be putting out press releases every time some Afghan American does something. But what it does mean is that we need to foster a community um, locally. You know, We're not going to be able to do it with everyone, but with people that are around us that um, promotes acceptance, that empathizes with uh, people across the community and supports diversity of opinion and diversity of experience. It's not a perfect solution, it's not an easy solution, but it's a step in the right direction. And when we're when we're trying to think about the victims and show support and, and all these things, I think sometimes we get caught up into like and, and I've struggled with this too, and, and even like, you know, at the last Afghan American conference we had a discussion around homophobia, and one of the things that we struggled with is that like, we always talk about it of like an us and them. It's never a we, you know, and, and, and that's something that I, I still, I'm, I'm, you know, like when, when this thing happens, you know, we have folks in our community who are, you know, who, are, who identify as queer, and like, you know, that that they face that double impact of like Islamophobia, of homophobia, like all those things. So I, it, yeah. So I, you know, you know, this 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 particular incident, you know, impacted, you know, the LGBTQ community, um, in in a huge way. And so I, I mean, if, if people want to kind of speak a little bit to, um, what that community is like for folks, you know, within the Afghan community, like you know, what have we seen, or you know, what's that like? Uh, Netta, you want to go ahead? And I think when I heard you saying that, I thought about how that us-we um, dynamic allows it to still be an other community. Like, it's still entirely separate from us, and so I think that allows it to not be real or not really sometimes be our problem, right? So, like, maybe we, we talk about it within our family, with our elders, or with our friends, but when there's this us-we dynamic, it's still so separate and, and not real. So maybe we'll talk about it, we'll have an in-depth conversation, but there's no deep grounded um, change or, or effort to want to change because it's still like this other community um, that's not really part of us or that we consider to not really be something we have to worry about. So I think that's, for, for me, when I hear the us we think, like I think it's just continuing um, that trend and we do definitely talk about it like that. Go ahead, Crystal. Um, I don't know if you folks have recently seen, but an article just came out about how he is gay, or was gay, mm -hmm. and had been seen um, at the club and also on gay dating sites. And the story that was coming up was, you know, he complained a lot about not being able to fully express himself within his family or within the community. and this is something that I see not only with sexuality but with other forms of expression we have as um, as Afghans but just to focus on sexuality you know it's it's not about it's not us and them it's like as a diaspora as a people we have to start coming up with strategies that aren't going to shame one another um, for our differences that are going to actually embrace um, and also support the Afghans and create safe spaces for the Afghans who would like to come out as queer but don't ever do it within the community for fear of being harmed um, or kicked out or disowned. Um, so I really think it's important for um, each Afghan to, to step up and to start challenging um, this rooted idea that we have in our communities that, you know, being queer is shameful, that you aren't allowed, you'll be kicked out of the family, um, and because if we don't start challenging that, we're just going to keep seeing these cases where other Afghans start acting out, you know, because they have no place to go, they have no resources, they have no one to talk to about these um, social issues that are coming up for them. Yeah. Go ahead, Ali. You know, um, I think that's a very important thing to, to consider there, because regardless of his motives, I mean, you, 
two days ago we heard it was a terrorist attack. He was connected to ISIS. Now there's there's you know there may be some type of self loathing involved. The one constant, I mean, regardless of his motives, is that we can be certain that he was inculcated with hate and homophobia, right? Whether that was from his parents, um, his upbringing, or from uh, the American community at large, and that's something that we need to address. That's the constant here, right? Is the, is the marginalization of a community, and bringing this to Afghan Americans, it's about def how do we define Afghan Americans? And I think there's a concerted attempt to um, define it narrowly. Afghan American looks a certain way, speaks a certain way. It's heteronormative. It's this. It's that. It's a particular religious expression, right? And that's what we need to challenge, and we need to push back against that and foster that diversity. So it isn't an us and them. That queer Afghans are Afghans, right? That it's not it's not a, a separate community. That it is our community, and it's a community that we need to reach out to and make feel welcomed and challenge and and stand with against the type of hate that um, our fellow Afghans face. So. Where does that come from then? Where you know, Ali, you have I know you do a lot of um, research on this on this particular topic, and you know I think a lot of people associate Islam and you know as you know a predominantly Muslim country and families, and associate that as being you know kind of going and homophobia kind of going hand in hand. So I know you have some expertise on that if you'd like to share. Yeah, um, I don't. Look, I don't want to bore everyone with like a detailed analysis. If you're interested, you can see the articles are posted on our page. Um, but I want to say that there is a, a sort of problem that's going on in the definition of Islam itself, in the same way that we have with the definition of who is an Afghan American. You have people on kind of both sides, not just uh, people who are Islamophobic or anti-religion, but also people within Islam itself that want to define the religion in very narrow ways. And what this does is um, it creates this kind of false impression that there's a monolithic interpretation of sexual diversity in Islam or sexuality in general in Islam and that's just not the case the history of Islam proves otherwise that there's all sorts of nuance that there's diversity there that there's outright contradictions that people don't even agree um, on the definition of sexuality within Islam and that complexity is erased um, it's erased in the modern debate and what you hear is that no there's only one interpretation and both sides agree on that interpretation and everyone in the middle gets flattened out and that's something that we need to highlight, that we need to false, we need to push back against, that we need to, um, uh, and it's that diversity that we need to fundamentally uh, foster and promote. I think that um, what we need to do is bring in these historical arguments, rekindle these diverse opinions, and make them at the forefront of our conversations. You know, these aren't things that are in the past; they're still very much present. But we seem unwilling to kind of challenge them or be even be aware of them. And Nora? Yeah, I think to uh, Ali mentions an important word, complexity, and that's one of the things that we are afraid of in 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 our communities because we're Afghan Americans. We're already dealing with like transition, right? If you're second generation or first generation, but we have to embrace the complexity and dynamic of a lived religion if we are practicing Muslims, if we're not, the other complexities with it. And push back, I think the most radical thing I can do as a practicing Muslim is be in spaces people don't expect to be me to be in. I am an observant Muslim because I subscribe to the faith because of love and mercy. That is what guides me individually, personally. So that's what pushes me to be in spaces to create loving and opening spaces with other people, to be in community with one another. And for whatever reason, there's a lot of people that make you scared to like push, to be in um, spaces where you don't know. Go to spaces where you may not know one another and be there and listen and be with one another. I think one of the most profound things that happened with me in Durham when this happened yesterday is one of my best friends, not Muslim, she's gay, one came up with an idea to have an iftar with another and we're going to host an iftar just to be with one another and sit and reflect and create a space of love and I think that if we locally take that this is a pretty radical act because it's simple acts like this that people don't take the time to be to, to have and I think this kind of conversation needs to happen locally wherever we are 
And so since since this has happened, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of Afghans have been really really fearful um, and just been really scared in terms of um, kind of the the blowback that comes from these types of incidents. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I received a message from somebody who said that they were afraid to kind of, you know, to go to the mosque just because of what might happen from there. So, you know, there's there's that um, additional kind of piece to all of this. So, um, wanted to hear from folks if they wanted to comment on that. So, Dode, you wanted to say something? Yeah, for me, um, I, I was I was afraid to go to work yesterday. Like, I can't hide that I'm Middle Eastern. Like, I I look it. It's all over my face. It's all over my beard. Um, and like I had my aunt text me from Virginia, like, please trim your beard. I, I don't want to see you get hurt. Like, like our families have a fear for us going out because, you know, they see like hate crimes to Muslims already. So this adding into it kind of makes them think that more is going to happen. So it, it was a really scary day for me yesterday. I kind of stayed to myself and like, I looked at everyone walking in and, just was making sure nothing was said to me. Didn't do anything to try to like rub anyone like the wrong way. It was it was a weird experience. Saba, we'll go, oh, go ahead, Neta. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, um, sorry, Saba. <laughs> I'll say for me, like I I already had a family member share with me an incident of racism experience this morning, um, and you know. It's only Monday. Um, so I think that's something that comes up for me too is like it's so quickly there's always backlash. And I think the lines really run together for people. It's like this person um, maybe initially before he was identified as Afghan had like a vaguely Middle Eastern name. And so people already had started this this kind of like just Islamophobic, like very xenophobic, like all of this backlash and so I think for me that just shows how um, everything is so colluded and it's so um, convenient for the media to frame things in this way to just really sensationalize it and um, really create this other and this universal enemy that um, very much I think is conducive to a larger kind of political agenda and systems of oppression internationally and so I think not to get like too abstract, but it definitely, I see it as part of a larger system and I think that's a hard thing too, is not only am, you know, in my experience I'm asked to be the representative for all Afghan people and to be like, so why did this happen? Can you please tell me? And so experiencing that in a personally and then also feeling, um, seeing it as a cog in this larger system is just, it's really hard. It's hard to know what to do with that. Go ahead, Saba. I mean, um, so I mean, the backlash is one thing, and it's like, it's not just a backlash because there already is a level of Islamophobia and hatred the Afghans are facing, right? Whether you, let, whether you identify as a practicing Muslim or not, um, the greater American community is going to view you as a Muslim, right? They're not really in the business of trying to differentiate you and what your faith and your practicing faith is. You kind of fall into that category if you look at it. So there are there there already is that Islamophobia that exists, and 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 more and more people, given the political climate we live in today, with especially with the elections, have been feeling more and more empowered, right, to um, to be more vocal about their hatred, um, and so that was already present, and just I myself was afraid, right? So I work for a civil rights organization um, in the Bay Area um, that. It's, it's called CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. So I, I see this on the daily, um, and I deal with it a lot. And we then just the number of hate calls that we get um, and hate mail that we get and, and the types of things that um, Muslims are called, like we're called maggot eaters and just and terrorists and a whole slew of hateful things and, and the threats that come with that. Um, it's real, right? The discrimination and, and the backlash that... Um, is face it's it's it happens in all spaces right it happen it can happen in just you know going to a restaurant it can happen you know in the workplace people um, are dealing with constant discrimination Afghans specifically that I've dealt with who deal with discrimination in the workplace because of their identity because of their um, religious identity because of their Afghan identity um, in at school in um, you know in elementary schools believe it or not I've had third graders third grade Afghans who have been dealing with discrimination not just from their classmates 
but from their teachers as well. And so there's um, there's a lot to say for that. Um, and so something like this has only heightened that and only heightens it and, and, and um, gives more fuel to that fire. Um, but it's also important and imperative as a community to kind of stand up and rise above that, you know, and um, and to respond to that appropriately. And so, um, and that's something we can talk about further. But definitely, there is there is definitely a heightened backlash, and um, Afghans are not immune to that by any means, um, and, and they haven't been. And go ahead, Crystal. I thought Ali was going next. Um, no, you, we got you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's it's terrible to see our community filled with so much fear um, because of the way that we present ourselves, or because of our last names, um, or where we worship. And you know, this has been strategically happening for a while, um, kind of demonizing the Muslim men, the Muslim woman, um, as an enemy in, in America. And it's intriguing to hear us share these stories of how we're scared personally or how we've had attacks. Like after 9-11, I had a lot of death threats to my family when I lived in um, Omaha, Nebraska. And, um, and I was a young person then, so growing up with that type of fear that something, you know, some type of harm could happen because of hatred based off of my heritage or my my family's practice and religion, you know, it's, it's harmful. It's like it doesn't help you think clearly living in a society. And what's interesting is that this sort of fear that we're experiencing as Afghans, whether you're practicing Muslim or not, is a similar fear that the queer community is also facing. You know, they're, they're doing a really great job at, like, scaring all of us into not expressing ourselves, into not speaking up, into not supporting one another, into turning against each other, you know, and I just keep thinking about, you know, the shooter and how he really fell prey to the ideologies of, um, of this country, and it's not everyone, but there definitely is this hatred that exists in the rhetoric, in, the, in our politics, in our schools, um, in our policies, there's so many policies against um, LG, uh, LGBTQ people and trans people happening all over right now. You know, and in addition to also so many um, things coming up against Muslims. And I just continually see it very important to, for all of us to just step back and really remember what type of people we are. We are a very loving, giving, caring people. And our diaspora is not just Muslim. Like, we're Buddhist, we're Zoroastrians, we're Jewish. You know, we, we are very many people, and it's time to make all of that visible you know, and to make all the different types of people visible, even though we're all scared. You know, it's like, for me now, it's like, how are we going to battle the fear? You know, that's what they want us to do. They want us to be frightened. And it's like, I'm not going to be scared anymore, and I don't want anyone to be scared. I don't want us to tolerate hatred anymore. You know, that's not in our culture. It's not who we are. And Ali John, go ahead. Yeah, I think these are all very important uh Points. And I think this goes back to, in some ways, to something that we mentioned in, the, in our previous conversation on Palestine, right? That these, this is part of a global system of inequality, something that Nader John was uh, uh, pointing towards and gesturing towards. That racism, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia are not separate, not separate things, but they intersect and they're all part of the same system of oppression and othering. It's why the type of activism that we do needs to be intersectional, right? That we can't be outraged that the Wolf Blitzer decided to interview the Afghan president because the shooter was Afghan. Yeah, that's insane, right? On some on some degree. I mean, if, if the guy was white, would we be German? Would we be uh, uh, interviewing Angela Merkel, right? Like, what do you have to say about this shooting? No, we should be outraged about that. But we should be equally outraged that the 50 people were killed that the, the shooting is not unrelated to the bathroom controversy that it's going on right in North Carolina, that these things are related, that there is a system of oppressing and otherizing people, and it's those groups of people that need to stick together. It's those groups of people that need to work together. It's those groups of people that need to recognize that they're part of that system, and it's that system that they need to dismantle, challenge, and overthrow. 
Annetta? I think for me, you actually took some of the words in my mouth. That's something I wanted to talk about too. Is I think when I step back, as Crystal said, I really see how these are the same systems of oppression just working in different communities, um, and the way that it affects us all in with sometimes in different ways, but it's still the same systems. And so um, one of the ways I see that is when we really internalize these um, same kind of like problematic systems and values that are marginalizing our communities. So one of the ways I see that is, you know, the shooter was a person of color who identified with an immigrant community, but so were the victims in this tragedy. You know, they were, it was a shooting at um, a, a queer space that was having like a Latino themed um, evening. And so I say Latino just to, to make it more gender neutral, but um, yeah, so I think that just speaks to how all of this is so ingrained and systemic um, and just the way that it happens. And again, just looking back to these very same uh, systems of oppression that are marginalizing our community and other uh, communities of folks of color. And so I think it's really important to be mindful of that and to think about, well, knowing that, how, how radical and how changing and deep can it be to build coalitions with one another and to collaborate. And it doesn't have to be like we're going to organize a march together, which is dope, you know, but like it can look different ways. Like if our dinner, like that's beautiful. And just other things that we can do to show solidarity with one another um, in ways, you know, big or small, because they all have an impact. And I think just making those shifts um, in, in culture, and I don't mean Afghan culture, but like our own culture, like the communities that we frequent and who we're supporting, um, making and that kind of our own cultures that we create um, in different ways that we can create shifts there. Um, so a lot of a lot of folks are talking about you know uniting in an intersectional way, which I totally agree with, and I think that uh, for a lot of folks. Um, at home, there's a question of like, what or who are we uniting against, right? And there's a lot of different kinds of folks that um, individuals are afraid of. I know um, for a fact that if I see uh, a specific kind of white male, then I become fearful for my life. And even though I'm a male, and I enjoy a lot of privilege in this society, I still am fearful for my life and whatever interaction I have with them. I have white male friends and I still am fearful. But I want to sort of pull away from just being afraid of a specific person and I want to redirect our fear and our um, radicalism uh, against an ideology which is this toxic American masculinity that has pervaded the way that American men are raised, whether you're Afghan, Latino, uh, black, Native American, there's this toxic American masculinity that seems to thrive off of insecurity. Whatever is other, whatever threatens our masculinity, our sense of the masculine, we have to put down and we have to put down violently. And in a lot of ways, I see that informing this man's actions. This uh, idea that because this person is other, or because I find something within myself that is other, I have to squash it. And the only way I can squash it is with bullets, which just feeds into this gross gun worship within this country. And I'm not advocating gun control or anything like that. I am advocating this stepping back away from adulation of the military, away from zealotry when it comes to the police and the fire departments, and treating these things, these weapons of death and destruction with the respect that they deserve. Every individual in this country has a right to arms, but they need to have respect for those arms when they have them, right? And if we, if we can reorient ourselves and combat this toxic American masculinity, um, Instead of just oh you know fight white people that's not that's not really it right because if you just fight white people you're excluding a group that could help. If we fight the underpinning ideology that powers that, I, I think we'll have a lot more success. Go ahead. I'm push back on Reza. I think that I think that yes we it is masculinity but there is white supremacy plays a role and maybe it's because I live in the south and I see how toxic this like white supremacist ideology permeates amongst people, even white liberals, that we have to hold people accountable because if even, okay, so I'm an ally. I'm, I have privilege as a straight person in terms of like my space. If people don't recognize their privilege, 
this didn't just happen to queer people, this happened to queer people of color. So there's this double fear, right, that's happening in these spaces. And that's not something, there's a lot going on with sort of like what Ali was talking about, and I think Nida brought it up, in terms of like, who is it that's setting up these systems of power and who is, who is creating this oppression? Look at the people that are creating this rhetoric in the campaign cycle. It's Donald Trump. It's a white male. And who is buying into this hateful rhetoric that is targeted towards Muslims and Latinos? It's not Latinos that are buying into and supporting Trump. It's a specific population, and I'm going to name it. It's scared white voters. So I think that I'm just going to push back and say that, yes, masculinity plays a role, but that this racial ideology comes from the group that's been given privilege over us in this hierarchy. And, and I want to just name that and sort of, that's my, you know, that's my bent to it. Reza, were you going to say something or no? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> not just, I, mean, no I wasn't going to say anything. No, I, I just, yeah, I agree with you. I just decided to focus on another thing. <laughs> Um, Saba, were you? Did you want to jump in as well? Gosh, I don't. I <laughs> that went somewhere else. So I'm not quite sure, but I think one of the things that Reza did bring up was the issue of guns and gun control and um, gun violence. And so, like, one thing is like this this tragic event that occurred is um, it's reflective of many things, right? So um, there's obviously the hatred and the homophobia you know, um, whether it's external or internalized homophobia that happened that, that led to it, the motives are not sure. Um, and there's also a mental health aspect to consider as well. But there's also, there is a fact that this is a, there is a gun issue here. There was a gun used in this horrific shooting, and it was an AR-15. That's the same weapon that's used, that was used in the tragedies of San Bernardino and Sandy Hook. Um, and so it's a pattern that we cannot allow to be continued. Um, right? There's just, like, if you think about it, there's been 134 mass shootings this year alone. And so it really, I don't know what it's going to take, but I think that there comes a point where we really do need to come together um, as a community, and not just as Afghans, but as, as Americans at large, to put an end to this ongoing tragedy um, and to hold political leaders accountable to denounce that type of violence as well. And um, and so that's just something I want to put out there. I don't want this to be solely focused, you know, as like a gun issue, but it is part of, the, it is something, and it's part of the conversation that people are having as well. Um, so, and it's, it's just something that I, I'd like to point out, but not to solely focus on, because there are other things, and um, this issue is multi-layered and multifaceted. Go ahead, David. Yeah, speaking on guns, um, I saw it on Facebook yesterday. I don't know who put it, but someone posted, after 9-11, we stopped letting people bring, like, nail clippers on planes. We stopped letting people bring box cutters on planes. We restricted people to keeping things less than 3.5 ounces in, like, liquid containers. We realized that something happened, and we didn't want it to happen again. But we've had how many mass shootings in the, since Sandy Hook? And we still haven't done anything to try to focus on controlling the guns in this country. Like, an AR-15 was used both in, San, or in, in Sandy Hook, used in Orlando, also used in San Bernardino. These are ass like assault rifles that are military grade that people are just going into gun stores and purchasing. Like, something needs to be done about that. I don't want the focus to be on gun control, but, I mean, that does play a factor in what happened in Orlando. Like, if he was that able, or if he was able to just pick up a weapon a couple of days before, like, things need to be happening to make sure things like this don't happen in the future. Yeah, go ahead. I think, thanks. I think something <laughs> that's important to think about, too, is the way that violence is normalized in this country and in all types of communities, and also especially our community. So, um, this thing happened and there's a lot of lots of things being said in the news and you know we can't really 
speak to what's true or not, but something um, we have read too is the other acts of violence that were going on in this person's life, um, domestic violence, interpersonal violence with other people, and what that makes me think about is how normalized this is in our community, and so what were other things that were happening that were normalized or looked over or that people didn't feel safe addressing, and we need to think about those things too. Um, so when violent acts are normalized in our community, there's a lot of reasons for that, right? It's, it's a survival mechanism. We're used to it. Some of it is historical. You know, it's been happening for a long time. It's been inserted in our community through colonization and imperialism and occupation. Um, but at the same time, like seeing where it happens and seeing where the ways that we can address it, where we feel safe to. Um, but again, just thinking about all the other ways that that violence is so normalized that maybe there are other things happening that should have been addressed too. And Crystal, go ahead. I think it's really easy for people to have conversations around guns because it's something that we can physically see and the harm that it causes. However, it's like if we start controlling, putting all of our energy into having discussions on gun control, Control, when we're going to start talking about homophobia and racism and classism, like what 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 is it going to take for American culture to start to recognize that in order for us to transform as a people, we have to actually put in the work to understand diversity. We have to put in the work to heal ourselves from all the trauma that we've gone through living in um, a system that is oppressive in many ways. Not only not only providing us opportunities, but also you know trying to put us into boxes, and so I'm not particularly interested in um, seeing a mass cultural conversation on gun control. I would like to see like what is it going to look like to end hatred. You know, it's so it's like why why are we trying to ban guns when we should maybe ban people from picking up a microphone and speaking hate, you know, <laughs> you know, or or helping them unlearn like that this isn't the way for humans to thrive together. Um, so, yeah, there's, that's just some thinking that I've been having because it's like, look, if we start controlling, um, banning guns, there's multiple other ways, you know, there's other ways to harm people, whether that's strangling, lynching, whatever it is, you know, like people are going to find ways to perpetuate hate. Uh, Crystal, uh, I have a question. Do you think silence is harmful? Like the fact that we're not talking about it, is that harmful? Especially I'm thinking about the invisible people in our community that identify in like many ways with things that we don't talk about like queer Afghans, we don't talk about like people with intersectional identities. So I wonder like beyond violent harm, like how does harm manifest itself and the fact that we've been silent, it took this to make us really sp like, like for Afghans to really like be more forward. So I, I wanted to pose that to everyone but since you just talked, I thought I'd ask you time. Yeah, I think I heard you earlier talk about like the normalization of thinking, just to paraphrase something awesome that you said earlier. And um, yeah, with if we're not stepping up and talking about these taboo issues, then they're not real in our in our thinking and in, in our communities and it it allows for all of these terrible things that we've learned about each other growing up in whatever country it is, you know, in Afghanistan there's a whole set of their own stereotypes and racism that exists against the peoples there and here we have our own set so it's super important. Um, I, I agree yeah, that silence is a form of violence and that the only way y'all that we're really going to transform is if people with privilege, that means straight Afghan men, start taking a risk in, you know, the parties that you all are having with each other and talking about queer issues, talking about women's issues, and really challenging each other. Um, we're only going to change if we talk about it. And that was just one example. <laughs> yeah. to, to Crystal's point, if we're going to talk about straight Afghan men, we need to like go a level higher and talk about straight Muslim Afghan men because a lot of the strictures in our society, a lot of the silence in our society comes from Muslim men, imams, uh, people who are in charge of masjids and, and mosques, these centers, these watering holes for young Muslim men to go to and learn how to live their lives. 
uh, a lot of these men are silent on these issues. Or if they have a queer Muslim Afghan coming into the masjid, then they turn them away. They ignore the problem. They act like it doesn't exist. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, I see that being reflected in non-imams, non-ulama, Afghan Muslim males on my Facebook feed or on Twitter or whatever, uh, deciding to erase the same way that the GOP have erased LGBT individuals from their own tragedy. Uh, deciding to talk about the Afghan Muslim perspective only and not really standing in solidarity with a community that they don't think exists. So I think that like, in, in a lot of ways, if we are going to call out straight Afghan men, we need to call out straight Afghan Muslim men too because those are the ones who have a lot of privilege in our diaspora who set a lot of rules down and, and can harm a lot of people with their silence. Go ahead. Oh yeah, go for it, Crystal. Yeah, yeah. I think that's um, really great for you to acknowledge that power dynamic that exists within the community. And I also want to continue to bring attention that not all Afghans are Muslim and are um, paying attention to the imams, but they still harbor patriarchy and misogyny. And we are all in spaces with each other at weddings, at parties, you know. So um, yes. I support you in calling that out in your community, and I also support other straight Afghan men to challenge each other. Go ahead, Ali. Thanks. So I want to kind of, there's a lot of really fascinating and wonderful things that were said, and I want to kind of bring them together. In some ways, I find myself in agreement with, with Noura and with Reza, right, because I don't see these as kind of two separate things, but I see them as, as related. So when when we say like we, we shouldn't focus on guns, and I totally agree, we need to have a serious conversation about homophobia, we need to have a serious conversation about hate. But I think guns also play a certain role in this, in, in particular because the Second Amendment is racialized, right? So you have the Second Amendment um, really being emphasized during the civil rights. It was the right to bear arms by a certain group of people, particularly white, straight males, to protect themselves from people of color. There's a reason why in the 1990s, you could have an assault rifle ban, and why under an Obama presidency, you can't even think about it. You can't even talk about it. If you're talking about it, the Muslim Kenyan socialist is coming for your guns, right? So I think that the, the, this is all interconnected, and and this goes back to the to the fact that this is intersectional. These aren't separate issues. These are issues that need to be addressed holistically. So how do we do that? We start by holding our community accountable. We hold each other accountable. We talk about this at the dinner table. We talk about this amongst our friends. We talk about this about, about everyone, right? So like uh, my mom is a prime example of this. She doesn't think of herself as homophobic, but she didn't want gay people to get married. She's like, no, no, but Jim, it's man and woman. That's how God intended. And I, I humanized. I talked about people, friends of mine that were gay. I brought them over for dinner, and I, and I made it a dinner table conversation. We hold each other accountable. We reach across communities. We work locally, but then we work across local communities. We reach out to people because we have these kind of social networks that we can do. We start to have those tough conversations. We start to have those tough um, um, discussions and then we translate those into policy. Hold our policymakers accountable. Tell them what we think. Um, you know, that's the start. We start there with the conversations. We start with intersectionality and we start with ourselves. We hold each other accountable and then we translate that into policy. Uh, we're getting close to the hour, so I I would like for us to start like you know any just some some closing thoughts and things that people wanted to share, maybe things that we haven't spoke about or haven't discussed yet um, that you all felt um, might be important for us to to hear. Um, Neta, can we start with you actually? Yeah, sure, that's fine. I think something I wanted to make sure. I wanted to say is just to really um, make it clear that like queer folks like we're here for you and we see you and the whole point of this conversation was to do that work uh, so it's not perfect and we're not perfect but know that there are people out there doing work um, in our in our families in our communities and the places we work um, all the other circles that we're in doing work to make this a safer world for, for you to be in and for all of us to be in in a way that's meaningful, in a way that's free, and in a way that's truly healthy. Um, queer Afghan folks, we see you. And again, doing that same work to, to be able to be in solidarity with one another and to 
instead of just like having conversations, like be in community so that we don't have to have these conversations and just continue to deepen and grow our community to be more all-encompassing and grow from this, as was stated earlier, this narrow idea of what it means to be Afghan American and what that looks like. Um, so again, we're doing our best and holding one another accountable and it takes, it's going to take more work and again, like I said, we're not perfect and our efforts won't always be perfect, but know that we see you and that we're here and ready to do the work. Yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, going off what um, Netta says, you know, uh, said mistakes on this journey of like un of unlearning oppression and like relearning how to treat one another like humans and with love. And I, I do believe that um, it's possible and that we are capable of a people of really looking at the internalized oppression that we hold and, um, and it should never happen. Hi, Crystal. Sorry. Uh, was, did anyone else oh, have some? I was on mute the whole time. I'm no, sorry. I think we're having some trouble with your sound. Anyone else having that, hearing that? I was on mute. I didn't unmute. Okay. <laughs> no, you were, you were, we could hear you, but your, your mic was a little bit off. Oh, really? Uh, take, out, take your mic in and out, and then maybe we'll, we'll get back to you. Okay. You're, okay. Um, I'll, I will get back to you, but um, I did want to just quickly touch on, like, you know, I think uh, reaching out to folks in our families that we, you know, um, you know, the queer folks in our families, because you know, and, and friends and whoever it may be, because we all, you know, um, we're, whether you know, I think a lot of times Abby and I try to pretend like you know we don't have folks who are queer in our community, but that's 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 false. And I think that um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is like you know the homophobia and like Islamophobia, right? Like for for many of us, like when we step outside of our home, we have this fear of like Islamophobia, someone attacking me, someone coming after me. Um, because I, I look Muslim, um, but for for folks who are you know in, in the LGBTQ community, like that fear doesn't just you know it doesn't uh, it, it's inside the home, it's outside the home for many folks in our community, and it's something we we need to acknowledge and something we need to really think about for those of us who are kind of focused on that aspect of like you know really thinking about how this is impacting folks in in different ways and and you getting kind of that. We talked a little bit about you know hit hit in the in like double and you know with with homophobia and Islamophobia so in both ways so um, just been thinking about that so you know I think really reaching out to folks in your in your family in your community and just checking in with people and you know um, and supporting them through this. Um, Crystal, I, we heard a lot of what you said so if you wanted to <laughs> uh, wrap up what you were saying briefly, um, we'll see if that might be. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just end with that I really believe that um, love will prevail and that as a people we're going to figure out how to continue to support all of our diversity or begin to really support and make visible our diversity because diversity can only make us stronger as a people. And okay. Dawood, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, as a community we need to unlearn hate. Like sometimes we'll see a lot of homophobia. It's not just an, an Afghan only thing or a Muslim only thing. We'll see it within like our greater community with, with our American friends or, you know. But I mean the last time we did a conversation about homophobia we had a guy like make fun of us on his page. Like look at these guys. They're talking like we need to teach our community how to not be hateful. Because spreading hate only leads to more hate. Um, I know it's it's cliche, but you know love does win. And if we spread love, it's just gonna make our community better and our world better as a whole. Um, Crystal said something uh, that I learned from th that it's okay to not know. If we come to the table with sincerity and trying to love one another. Um, I want to be an ally, but I know fully that I will never understand the experience and fear that people have to go through having a marginal identity. And I think if we come with it with sincerity, that goes a long way. And um, I have ignorances I need to overcome as I try to be a better ally. 
And I think that if we let go of the fear of not knowing or not open with one another, that can go a lot of a lot of way of closing the hurt and gap that people feel um, in these processes. Um, I would say I would definitely echo you, Nuda John. Like, and the point that was made, like, you know, we're not perfect. Um, I myself am constantly learning as an ally, and um, I've just been fortunate enough to have the right people in my life to teach me. Um, to teach me things and help me unlearn a lot of things that I was conditioned to think and um, you know there is a very real stigma in our community um, and it's something that we have to unpack and we do have to unlearn and we do have to challenge and we do have to push back on I mean, the, and the main thing that I, I want to come out of this conversation is that what happened in Orlando was a hate crime okay and um, an entire community because of their sexual orientation was targeted and that's that's what we're dealing with is this this homophobia and um, and it's really really tragic and I just feel like there's there's so much that we can do to stand up as a community against that type of hatred you know nobody should have to be fearful of their life because of you know what they identify as you know sexually or um, or for their religious faith and so Afghans we already understand what xenophobia is like and what um, Islamophobia is like and there are Afghans who also have to deal with on top of that homophobia and we just really need to be better at supporting each other and being there for each other and um, and yes being accepting of one another um, because that's how we'll only grow as a community so it's my Uh, last chance if anyone else wants to um, uh, say something. Um, otherwise, we're going to go ahead and uh, wrap up. But um, Reza, I'll, Reza and Ali, I'll give you two of the last words, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. I'll just keep it super brief. I think I get really impatient with um, abstract thought and uh, abstract, I don't know, just like, I want, uh, and I think a lot of our audience wants, um, actionable steps, right? What does love look like? Right? What does compassion look like? And I think a, a lot of what that looks like is what Nuro said, going to spaces that you're not comfortable with. But if you can't do that, and that isn't within the scope of what you can do right now, right? Go to the space that you are comfortable with. For a lot of uh, the Muslim Afghan community, they're not comfortable going to gay pride parades. And you know what? You can still donate blood, right? Donate blood. Because a lot of people uh, in the LGBT community suffer from prejudicial uh, blood donation practices where they're not allowed to donate still, right? And so there, there are some things that um, there, love it can come in different ways, right? You don't, you don't just have to do one thing. There are so many other things that we can do to turn love into action. Um, and I know that love in and of itself is a radical action. But I think that like there's some other things that we can do too. So, uh, Ali, go ahead. Um, I am loving all the see loving. I am loving all the messages of love that I'm hearing, and I think it is fantastic. But I think as we end this kind of discussion, we should be careful to also remember that this affected the the Latino community, that it affected people of color that it affected specific groups and to not forget them, not to erase their identities in our abstract discussions and our calls for love and unity because their identities are also extremely important, their cultures are also extremely important. Um, and so just to remember remember our, our fellows in humanity in that regard. Uh, so I guess we'll we'll go ahead and end on that. So thank you all for um, for tuning in for uh, tonight's discussion. Um, please feel free to continue to comment, have these discussions on the Facebook page, and you know, like we always end these things, is that you know this shouldn't be a one-time thing. This shouldn't be a one-time discussion. There's more that we could say, more that we can do, and we encourage everybody to continue doing that, having these conversations in your own spaces, within your own communities, and uh, where you're at. So um, thank you all for joining us on the Samoa Network. And we will hope to see you soon. Bye.